Okay, hi everyone. So um, I'm Kostis uh, Papagiotakis from QMUL, and uh, for this lecture, uh, I will be talking about the superconformal index. Um, I'd like to say that uh, in the spirit of these uh, of these lectures, this is not going to be a very comprehensive discussion of the subject. Um, I would like to be inclusive. No prior knowledge of this topic is required. And in order to keep things quite, um, let's say, big picture and to understand the um, concepts behind the formulation of the index and its usefulness, I'm not going to be uh, very um, uh, specific uh, about formulae to begin with uh, because the formulae depend on the specifics of the theory for which the index is calculated. We'll do that uh, a little bit later on. But I would like you to come out of this lecture uh, by having an understanding of why we want this quantity, what is it good for, uh, what does it do for us, and how we go about calculating it and connecting it to problems that are of interest. There are going to be some questions uh, in, the, uh, in, in the homework sheet which will uh, force you to uh, get a little bit more, uh, um, you know, get your hands dirty with the uh, practicalities of calculating indices uh, and so on. Uh, okay, so the general discussion is going to be split into the following uh, topics. Uh, there is going to be a, a brief motivation behind the index. Uh, uh, then uh, I will go over some representation theory on the structure of unitary irreducible representations of the superconformal algebra, which are necessary for us to understand what kind of object the index uh, counts. Uh, then I will provide a definition uh, in general first, a construction, I, I would should say, and a definition in general, and then we'll get specific by picking uh, the example of four-dimensional superconformal field theories with uh, n equals two supersymmetry, uh, that is 16 supercharges. Finally, we will discuss some interesting limits of the superconformal index in the specific case of four dimensions with n equals two supersymmetry, and we will close with some applications of the index and some connections to some um, interesting physical setups. So without further ado, Let's uh, begin with the uh, broad motivation. It's been known for uh, quite a few years, since the early 80s, through the work of Witten, that in supersymmetric quantum mechanics, you can construct an object, an index in fact, known as the supersymmetric index or as the Witten index. And what this object counts is supersymmetric ground states, which do not bear up under continuous deformations of the theory. And um, I am making here the assumption that these continuous deformations are SUSY preserving, so they do not break um, your supersymmetry, the supersymmetry of your theory. Let me tell you pictorially first what this object does, and then we'll see a little bit more about how it is defined in practice. So imagine you've got a, a theory with the following uh, space of uh, supersymmetric states. As you know from your supersymmetry classes, states which have finite energy, bosonic and fermionic states are paired, uh, can be paired by supersymmetry, so there are supersymmetry, um, uh, supersymmetric multiplets which uh, involve both bosonic and fermionic states. And it can happen that um, you have some parameter of your theory being continuously varied, which changes the energy of these states. Um, you turn on some interactions, for example, uh, um, and uh, some states become uh, uh, have energy uh, which is not uh, that of the ground state. So here pictorially, let's say, uh, just for the sake of concreteness, that these uh, solid um, white blobs are bosonic states and the x's here are fermionic states. Let's say you start from a configuration of this type and then uh, you perform some continuous deformation that uh, brings the energy of this pair down to this stage and then eventually down to a um, situation where they're all ground states. What the Witten index counts is just the number of states, ground states, which do not pair up under such continuous deformations. So two bosonic states in this case. Uh, and in fact, even in the case where all of these guys are ground states, it still just counts the ones that uh, are not going to be lifted. So how do we define this index? Um, this index is a seemingly innocent looking modification of the standard definition of the partition function. Okay, so by I will denote the index. It's defined as follows. Your partition function will be just a trace of the Hilbert state, uh, uh, Hilbert space of states of your theory, this uh, uh, math cal H, 
And here you've got e to the minus beta h. Beta is 1 over the temperature, as usual, and h is the Hamiltonian of your theory. Now, the difference between the index and uh, the partition function is this factor over there, minus 1 to the f. f here is the fermion number operator, so it's some operator that is um, odd for fermions and even for bosons, uh, bosonic states of your theory. Uh, and as you can see from here, uh, it kind of makes them contribute to this uh, partition function uh, with opposite signs. So let me remind you some facts from, uh, uh, let's say, uh, supersymmetric quantum mechanics with uh, uh, only two uh, supercharges, Q and Q bar, where bar is the um, complex conjugate or the uh, Hermitian conjugate of Q. So obviously Q and H, the Hamiltonian commute, and Q and Q bar anti-commute into the Hamiltonian, possibly modulo some factors of two, depending on your normalization. What we would like to do here is to uh, 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 consider, see what kind of um, uh, what kind of expression we get when we evaluate uh, this quantity over the Hilbert space uh, of, uh, of, our, of our theory. So consider a state psi, uh, which is uh, an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, so it has uh, energy E. And uh, let's see what happens when we uh, uh, take this quantity and act with it with, uh, let's say, uh, Q bar. So um, I'm assuming here that uh, psi is uh, uh, a state uh, which gets annihilated by Q. Uh, so Q bar actually generates its uh, supersymmetric partner in the supersymmetry multiplet. So uh, Q bar with H, Q bar and H commute uh, by acting, uh, I could have acted with H to begin with actually, so then you find that the energy of the super partner of Psi is obviously the same as the super partner, as the, uh, the original state Psi. This is just the fact that we said earlier on that these states, uh, uh, when they have non-zero energy, are paired under supersymmetry. Uh, obviously, when the energy is zero, this discussion doesn't make much sense. Uh, so notice here that the only thing that this partition function is actually measuring is um, the uh, an exponential which is uh, weighted by the energy of the state. So psi and q bar psi will have the same um, kind of contribution, and then because of this minus one to the f, are going to pairwise cancel as advertised in this discussion over here. Okay, so you see that the role of this uh, minus 1 to the f uh, uh, is to uh, uh, actually capture these cancellations. Okay, so as I said, bosonic and fermionic states with um, non-zero energy, positive and non-zero, so positive energy, are linked by supersymmetry. And because of this minus 1 to the f factor, they actually cancel out exactly uh, in the index. Therefore, the only thing that the index counts are states with zero energy, and all these states in this present example contribute uh, just a factor of one. So you just have a sum of ones where the sum runs over the uh, number of states of, uh, of your theory. The Witten index is a robust quantity, and uh, what I mean by this, uh, again, is the statement that it does not change under continuous deformations. In fact, I should say, just from the uh, this expression over here, you see that the index does not depend, for example, on beta, because all the states where beta would be coming in pairwise cancel, so it is independent of this parameter beta, and in fact, it is independent of any other continuous parameter, which uh, still uh, deformation, which preserves uh, supersymmetry. It's a bunch of ones, right? So if you change continuously a parameter, you expect some kind of continuous deformation of the index, but you know the index is just a bunch of numbers. Um, it does not change continuously. You can have potentially some discrete jumps, but let not, let's not go to that. Um, let's not investigate that subtlety uh, right now. So the Witten index, as we said, is a, oops, a robust quantity. And uh, um, you can uh, calculate it, for example, with interactions turned off. Uh, if you're, um, let's say, you're coupling, um, obviously in this case preserves uh, preserves supersymmetry uh, as you turn it on. And then it is, uh, if interactions preserve supersymmetry, is what I should say. And then it is still an accurate. What you calculate in the free limit is still an accurate result when these uh, interactions are turned on. So why is this index useful? Well. It does provide us less information than the full partition function of the theory. But as you uh, can tell from this observation over here, it does provide you with much more control than the partition function, where um, I can calculate, let's say, in the free limit, and then I can extrapolate the answer uh, uh, when the interactions are uh, very strong.
So more control, less information. Well, we'll take what uh, what we can. It's a very useful object to have, and it gives you uh, some intuition about uh, um, you know supersymmetry, supersymmetry breaking, and so on. So this discussion of the um, with an index is the starting point for the uh, uh, construction of the superconformal index. The difference is in the name. Instead of just having a supersymmetric index, we have a superconformal index. And roughly, the replacement is the following. Uh, previously, we had our partition function uh, being defined in terms of the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian was the anti-commutator of Q and Q bar or Q dagger. And in a superconformal theory, I'll explain exactly how this comes about. We have uh, uh, it being replaced by the anti-commutator of Q and S. Q are the Poincaré supercharges that you know and love. S are the so-called superconformal supercharges, uh, uh, which are the same in number in a superconformal theory as the Poincaré supercharges. And we'll see how, uh, as I said, this comes about. And also the kinds of quantities that are going to be contributing to the index. Here is a uh, supersymmetric vacua. Uh, uh, for the supersymmetric index or the Witten index, for the superconformal index, it's going to be short, unitary, irreducible representations of the superconformal algebra. And uh, because of this reason, it is uh, important and useful to have a brief discussion of what these unitary, irreducible representations of the superconformal algebra are. This brings me to the next uh, section of, uh, of this discussion. Uh, where we discuss some representation theory uh, uh, of uh, the structure of uh, uh, unitary irreducible representations. So if we're interested in superconformal algebras which enter uh, uh, nice uh, superconformal field theories, and by that I mean uh, we're trying to cap the number of um, uh, super Poincaré supercharges of your theory to 16, these superconformal algebras have been completely classified. The classification was done by Nam back in 78, and this discussion is based on a uh, another classification, uh, a supersymmetric extension, let's say, of the uh, Cartan classification of uh, um, uh, semi-simple algebras to uh, Lie superalgebras. So Katz uh, has a very thorough discussion in the Lie superalgebra case, and uh, from dimensions 3 to dimensions 6, which is the highest number of dimensions for which you can have superconformal symmetry, uh, we have the following uh, the following results. So, using Katz's Katz's notation, uh, we have that uh, the Lie superalgebra in three dimensions is OSP n slash four. By OSP over here, mean that there is an SO n component and SP four component. Uh, SP four in this notation is um, uh, means USP four which is uh, isomorphic to uh, 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 SO5, uh, roughly speaking, but in this case, uh, we're going to use uh, this uh, uh, real form SO2,3. So you see in here, you have the conformal group in three dimensions, SO2,3, and then you have SON, which is the R symmetry group in three dimensions, uh, depending on the amount of supersymmetry. So this uh, uh, goes all the way up to uh, 8 in 3D. And you can find here for n equals 8, for example, uh, the uh, uh, the Bagge Lambert uh, theory uh, describing two uh, and two brains, or the ABJM uh, uh, theory where n equals six. For d equals four, you get the familiar uh, examples where you have uh, uh, U2 R symmetry and uh, uh, U1. Uh, I guess uh, you can also have, by the way, uh, n equals three. So you can have n equals three superconformal uh, theories in four dimensions, even though these ones uh, do not have a Lagrangian, do not admit a Lagrangian description, but uh, there are non-Lagrangian realizations uh, of these uh, uh, superconformal algebras. And uh, this example here is the one for uh, n equals four superangles in four dimensions, where your R symmetry group is SU4 instead of S4. An interesting observation is that in five dimensions, uh, this is the conformal group, and this is the R symmetry group. Uh, this uh, example here uh, has eight supercharges instead of uh, instead of uh, 16, there is no five dimensional theory which is conformal, superconformal with 16 supercharges. And in 6D, we have, uh, uh, which is the last uh, number of dimensions where we can have a superconformal theory, you can have the famous uh, 1,0 uh, and 2,0 uh, theories which describe multiple and five brains in M theory. Okay, wonderful. So 
all states in a superconformal field theory by construction should be falling under unitary irreducible representations of the corresponding superconformal algebra. And it turns out that uh, once we know the SCA, we can classify these irreducible representations, uh, uh, which are unitary, and build uh, these representations explicitly. So just to remind you the type of generators that the superconformal algebra contains, it is uh, uh, the following. Obviously, you've got Lorentz generators. I'm not going to be introducing specific indices here because I am talking about the uh, um, case which does not focus, a case that does not focus on, uh, on dimensions. And obviously, these indices are going to be uh, changing as I change uh, my dimension. But the general structure is, uh, is the same and fixed. So I have a bunch of Lorentz generators, which uh, I'm going to denote roughly by M. R symmetry generators are uh, a dilatation uh, generator D, momenta, which are, uh, have uh, the same are the same number as uh, that of your space-time uh, dimensions, and special co conformal transformations K. These are all the bosonic generators that uh, I can have in my superconformal algebra. And uh, since this is a Z2 graded algebra, there are fermionic generators as well. We have the Poincaré uh, supersymmetry denoted by my Qs, and also the superconformal supersymmetry denoted by S's. Okay, so these satisfy particular uh, commutation and anti-commutation relations, um, and these define for you your uh, your algebra. Now, how do we build representations for these um, uh, for these superconformal algebras? Well, you can follow the prescription um, that uh, uh, here I have learned from the papers of Dobrev and Petkova in, uh, back in the 80s, or a discussion of uh, Minuala, uh, who uh, revived this kind of uh, approach in the uh, wake of the AD50 correspondence when these uh, unitary irreducible representations became very important uh, once again. So start the uh, uh, whole discussion with a superconformal primary. Let's call the superconformal primary for the moment abstractly uh, by this, uh, let's denote it by this state psi. Superconformal primaries, by definition, are annihilated in an uh, appropriate uh, uh, basis by all the superconformal uh, uh, supercharges, S. Okay, by definition, the S is all kill psi. And uh, because they are also conformal primaries, they get annihilated by K, the special conformal transformations. Okay, so the definition of a conformal primary is one where K uh, uh, kills it. Conformal primaries, uh, just to state the same thing again, is uh, our states psi prime, which get killed by k. Okay, so now start with these guys and uh, identify the maximal compact bosonic subalgebra of your superconformal algebra. Let me give you an example. For a 4dn equals 2 theory, the superconformal algebra that we wrote in the previous page is su22 slash 2. This denotes the um, uh, supersymmetry or the fermionic uh, components of your algebra. This is the bosonic part. And we wrote already in the previous page that this has a, uh, a bosonic subgroup, which is SO2,2, uh, uh, direct sum with U2. Okay, these are all algebras. Now, in turn, over here, you can identify a compact bosonic subalgebra in terms of SO2 from this factor and SO4 from this factor. And I can associate, uh, uh, I can look for particular um, irreducible representations of this maximal compact bosonic subalgebra. We, uh, this SO2 just has uh, one number characterizing these uh, irreducible representations. Uh, this is the eigenvalue of my generator, the dilatation generator, generator D, which just for um, to follow usual conventions, I'll denote as delta. Then uh, there are also uh, Lorentz representations for this uh, Euclidianized Lorentz symmetry SO4, which I denote by M. I'm being a little bit careless here, and everyone in the literature also is, where we denote the generators and the uh, quantum numbers associated with the um, with these generators with the same letter, except from delta. It's a little bit inconsistent, but M are going to be quantum numbers uh, uh, that uh, uh, label the representations of SO4, and R are quantum numbers that label the representation of the R symmetry, which in this case is U2. So these superconformal primaries, our friends Psi over here, are in one-to-one -one correspondence 
with the highest weight states of this maximal compact subalgebra. That means that I can identify and label my psi's by these respective quantum numbers, and in particular their highest weight uh, states. Delta, again, is one number, the height, but these representations uh, uh, can have finite size, so uh, the highest weight labels the representation, the Lorentz representation, and R here labels the R symmetry representation. Okay, so by this I mean the highest weight. Once you've done this, it is now straightforward to complete the construction of your irreducible representation. Uh, the only operators that you've got left at your disposal are S's, K's, and Q's, and P's. Okay. We know that S's and K's annihilate this guy, so the only thing that you can do is now build the representation using uh, uh, these ladder operators Q and P, which we'll do uh, in a second. Okay, so super conformal descendants are obtained by acting with the Poincaré supercharges Q, and conformal descendants are obtained by acting with the momentum operators P. Therefore, a basis for the representation space of the super conformal algebra is given as follows. Okay, you have the superconformal primary labeled, as we said in the previous page, by these quantum numbers or these highest uh, 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 weight states. And then you just can act on them with a finite number of Qs. Qs are nilpotent, potent, so you can only act once with them on a particular state. But I can act with an infinite number of Ps. So this is what I just said finite numbers of superconformal descendants because you've got a finite number of Qs, so these numbers of n that you have here, uh, for example, for n equals 2 run from, um, uh, from the eight, 8 Qs that you can possibly act with, and there is an infinite number of conformal descendants that you can obtain by acting with the Ps. Okay, this is how you would go about constructing a generic long multiplet of the superconformal algebra. There's no restriction, anything goes, you can act with all the Qs and Ps that you've got at your disposal. However, there exist examples, and these are interesting examples, for which, in addition to the S's annihilating all the S's annihilating the superconformal primary, this guy, you can have a combination of Q's also annihilating the superconformal primary state. As a result, you see the multiples, the superconformal multiples that you're going to build by the action of the Q's are, have fewer states than your generic so-called long multiples. And we uh, uh, refer to these multiplets as short multiplets, okay? Because we've got fewer cues to uh, to act with. These are going to be the stars of the show. These are going to be the kinds of uh, multiplets that the superconformal index uh, ends up receiving contributions from. Okay, so this was a very generic discussion. Um, obviously, there are many possibilities uh, that one can have here. How do you classify these short multiplets, first of all, even before we go to the index? The first thing to uh, uh, mention is that there is a systematic approach that one can take to this, uh, uh, to address, uh, to attack this problem using a Euclidianized version of the superconformal algebra. And in fact, uh, we will be working with uh, superconformal field theories in flat space, always, and uh, uh, we're, we're going to be choosing a Euclidean signature, and uh, uh, therefore uh, we will be uh, also uh, ordering our operators using radial quantization. Okay, so this is the uh, working assumption that we will make uh, use of. Now, in the Euclidean version of this uh, uh, superconformal algebra, it turns out that uh, you can come up with a base of generators which are, is not Hermitian, and by this I mean either Hermitian or anti-Hermitian. Instead of P, um, Hermitian conjugate being P uh, uh, or minus P, it goes, to, uh, it goes to K, and likewise Q dagger uh, can be identified with S. Very roughly speaking, again, these are statements which are uh, depending on the dimension of space-time, they're kind of, you know, when these, these things are spinners, you have to be a little bit careful about what kind of uh, uh, conditions this thing introduces. I'm being very, very schematic here, uh, so as to get the uh, the big picture. So, P's and K's are going to participate as usual in uh, commutation relations that involve the Lorentz generators and the dilatation generator. Q and S, or Q and Q dagger, uh, uh, involves M, D, and R in different combinations again space time dependent and uh, uh, depending also on the amount of supersymmetry okay so 
in this uh, case, uh, unitarity has to be ensured that these are unitary irreducible representations of your spectrum of algebra. And uh, uh, you need to make sure that this is the case uh, for all your states. Now, it can happen. So the th kinds of things that you're allowed for is states which have a norm that is positive semi-definite. Okay, so positive definite norms are fine. These correspond to generic long representations. But it can also happen that you can have some states which have uh, zero norm. These states are null and need to be removed from the corresponding uh, multiplet. Uh, the remaining multiplet is short, and uh, this kind of removal leads to shortening conditions of the type that I mentioned uh, over here before. So let me give you a very, very rough example. Let's say you have this particular highest weight state, the specific state, not the full irreducible representation, and you want to calculate its norm. Uh, so I can write this in terms of uh, this um, bracket state and then uh, Q dagger as we saw over here is S. Uh, in order to evaluate this thing you can pass S to the right of Q and you pick up a commutator term that is proportional to these numbers over there. So you can see that this norm can be zero if there is a very specific relationship between the um, uh, scaling dimension of the um, uh, of the uh, of the eigenvalue of the dilatation operator that uh, uh, associated with this state and these Lorentz and our symmetry quantum numbers. So let me say that maybe in a slightly different way. It can happen that there is a um, that when the combinations of Lorentz, uh, R symmetry, and dilatation uh, 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 quantum numbers satisfy relations of this type, there are null states and the corresponding um, the corresponding uh, superconformal multiplet is short. This is the kind of thing that you see if you impose these conditions in your uh, representation building. Okay, so some comments. This kind of discussion uh, is completely sufficient, is sufficient to completely classify all UIRs of the superconformal algebra relevant for uh, our field theory uh, um, for the field theories of interest to us, uh, you don't have to check, you know, an infinite number of uh, of norms because uh, at the first few levels you actually get the strongest bounds. So you just need a proof that these bounds that there are no additional bounds that come in by evaluating norms at higher. Uh, as you build more complicated states, you can perform these kinds of uh, proofs for all the uh, examples that I mentioned uh, earlier earlier on. And uh, apart from just saying what kind of multiplets uh, you have, so there's going to be multiplets that satisfy certain conditions of this type, which classify what kind of short uh, 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 representation multiplets you can have. And uh, there is some associated um, shortening conditions uh, that uh, pair up with them. You can build these representations. So uh, a discussion of how to build these representations by um, analyzing all the possible shortening conditions was done in the early 2000s by Dolan and Osborne in a classic paper uh, which does this for four-dimensional theories with n equals 2 and n equals 4 superconformal symmetry. Then uh, in 5D and 6D uh, we had a construction with Matt Weekend here from QMUL and my former student Joe Haling. Uh, uh, so 5D n equals 1 and 6D 1, 0 and 2, 0 theories. And uh, uh, then there is a, a quite a comprehensive uh, piece of work by Cordova, Dimitrescu, Intrilligata, uh, where they build all these representations uh, from three dimensions all the way to six dimensions with all amounts of supersymmetry. So these are just places where you can go if you're interested in the structure of these representations and you can read off what the representation associated with particular um, superconformal primaries looks like. Just to give you an idea of why we're interested in this uh, nice, in this uh, short uh, multiplets of the superconformal algebra, because many of the uh, kinds of um, objects that you encounter, even in nice simple field theory constructions, which involve vector multiplets, hypermultiplets, various currents, etc., uh, sit inside uh, these uh, um, uh, short multiplets of the superconformal algebra. And as a final comment, I should say that the superconformal algebra constrains what can happen, so it tells you what kind of multiplets are allowed, okay, in the theory, but it does not tell you which ones of these multiplets are actually realized in the theory. Okay, so it just gives you constraints on what kind of things can appear, but of course the theory itself, the dynamics of the theory might 
tell you what kind of which of these multiplets are uh, realized in a physical setup. Uh, so it is not completely, uh, uh, you know, this discussion of the superconformal algebra UIRs is not. Um, it gives you again some structure to play with, and, uh, uh, and then you know that the states that you can find in physical theory has to fit into that structure. Great. So now we're finally at the stage where we can start talking about uh, defining the index. Again, I'll do this quite generally. Uh, to begin with, and then I will uh, uh, write down some very specific expressions in the case of 4D uh, SCFTs with n equals 2 supersymmetry. So the first thing to do is to pick the spoken formal field theory that we're interested in uh, to write the index for, and uh, there is an associated spoken formal algebra, as we've already seen. Then uh, we pick up one of the supercharges, that is uh, one of the Poincaré generators, let's say, that is part of this superformal algebra, and construct the following quantity. As advertised earlier on, this is a very similar looking expression to the supersymmetric, supersymmetric index, or the Witten index, with the change uh, that instead of having q, uh, comma q bar, which was q dagger, we have q, comma s, because we're working in this Euclidean version of this superformal algebra, where q dagger is s. Okay, wonderful. We keep the minus 1 to the f, and here the uh, uh, space that we're tracing over in this uh, uh, kind of partition function is a space of local quantum operators. Okay, So this kind of quantity, the way that it was defined originally, does not keep track of any non-local operators, which our theory uh, uh, clearly has. So once again, following the discussion of the Witten index, um, there are bosonic and fermionic states, which uh, are related, uh, which have Q and S uh, uh, not zero, uh, that pairwise cancel, exactly like uh, what we saw in the uh, Witten index. Uh, and the only ones that are going to contribute, which not pairwise cancel, are the ones for which Q uh, and S uh, uh, is non-zero on the state. These uh, belong to short multiplets. In fact, they turn, it turns out that these states are annihilated by uh, by Qs, so they belong to short multiples of the superconformal algebra, and as you can see from the way that I've written things over here, uh, the index again is going to be independent of beta, uh, and uh, um, it's going to be uh, just uh, in the way that I've written it, a bunch of uh, ones. Okay, so the final answer that you would get is the um, uh, total number of uh, of states uh, in my theory, which uh, satisfy uh, this condition. Okay, so some comments. Like for the Witten index, um, it can happen that in the same way that supersymmetric states uh, under continuous under deformations that do not break supersymmetry pair up uh, and uh, uh, assume finite energy, you can have a recombination of full short multiplets of the superformal algebra into long ones. So these possibilities are known just by the structure of the superformal algebra and they are known as recombination rules. So there are rules that tell you that, oh, it is possible that this short multiplet and this short multiplet can recombine into a long multiplet under some continuous deformation. This uh, I've sketched over here. So this L stands for a long multiplet, epsilon is some parameter. And uh, it can happen, as I said, that as epsilon goes to zero, continuously, you can uh, have a uh, decomposition of L into two short multiplets, let's say A and B. By construction, the superformal index does not receive contributions from such combinations. And that means that the index evaluated, let's say, on this short multiplet is, has the opposite value uh, to the index evaluated on this multiplet, right? So even when... Um, you are uh, in, a, in, in at the point in your parameter space where uh, um, these guys are not long and they are short, the index does not count. The index, again, is a number. It cannot change continuously. So not only does it not depend on, um, uh, on beta, but it does not depend on any other continuous parameter uh, that obviously preserves uh, the superconformal symmetry. And uh, 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 another comment to keep in mind is that here we're talking about contributions from whole superconformal multiplets. 
these multiplets have to satisfy uh, the states in these multiplets have to satisfy these kinds of conditions and it's not true that all states in a short multiplet contribute to the index okay you just have to uh, make sure that you evaluate this quantity for each state in the multiplet and then you get some of them contributing and some of them not contributing the representations of the conformal algebra that we've uh, built are infinite dimensional uh, because uh, as we saw earlier on there is an infinite number of p's of conformal descendants that we can build out of uh, the uh, superconformal primaries and the superconformal descendants so uh, obviously if i define the index in this way uh, you get just get a diverging quantity okay you just get a bunch of ones for each state that contributes and since you've got an infinite number of them you get a divergence so what we do at this stage is we try to refine the index or weigh the contributions in a particular way. What's the best that we can do? So what's the maximal amount of refinement that we can introduce? Well, this uh, is uh, goes hand in hand with the maximal set of gener generators of the superconformal algebra. And by that, I mean whatever linear combinations you can come up with that commute both with Q and with S, and as a result, also with QS anti-commutator. Okay, so you want them to commute with QS anti-commutator, uh, uh, but you also want to commute with QNS so that you don't ruin the pairing of the um, of the states that cancel out uh, uh, by the uh, by this minus one to the F. So let's say that you found what this. So let's say you pick a Q, and then you find uh, this uh, uh, maximal commuting subalgebra, this commutant of the superconformal algebra. Let's say that these bunches of generators that commute with QNS are C1, C2, and C3 schematically. So then you can uh, refine, it could be that they don't have to be three, right? This The rank of this commutant depends obviously on the superconformal algebra that you are uh, considering. So then you can refine the index as follows, trace minus one to the F e to the minus beta QS anti-commutator, and then you can introduce these new variables um, which are known following the analogy with um, statistical mechanics as fugacities, which are weighted by the C1, C2, and C3. And all this thing obviously is evaluated on the uh, spectrum on, of, uh, uh, of local operators of your theory. These P's, the fugacities, can also be re-expressed in terms of the uh, exponential of uh, uh, up to some normalization uh, minus beta, let's say, up, uq, ut. These quantities, up, uq, ut, again, are following the um, an analogy with statistical mechanics, are referred to as chemical potentials. Okay, so you've got these fugacities and an associated chemical potential, and you can use these things to refine or grade your uh, index. Here, I have spoken about the maximal the maximal refinement I can perform if I don't introduce any additional symmetry. Obviously, one can perform additional refinements with symmetries that are not part of the superconformal algebra. So let's say um, we'll see uh, uh, in a minute that when you talk about gauge theories, uh, your states also are in some representation of the gauge group. Or um, let's say you have some global symmetries and you can uh, re further refine your states by uh, adding a, a fugacity that keeps track of that global uh, of that global symmetry. But uh, this is if you just have this conformal algebra, this is the best uh, that you can do. And obviously, this is a very useful thing to do because it kind of gives you a way of identifying if someone just gave you the index. Let's say there was some way of calculating it. It could be that by looking at the term, you can kind of see which multiplet it comes from, or which state it uh, it comes from. So that the more um, as you, if you did not have these guys, you remember all the states were contributing uh, with uh, um, with a one. Uh, in this particular example, um, there will be different polynomials of p. Or I guess each state contributes a different monomial of p, q, and t. Okay. So finally, let's try and be a little bit more concrete, uh, so that you don't think this is all completely wishy-washy. You can uh, focus in four dimensions, and let's say an n equals two superconformal theory. The n equals 2 superconformal algebra was SU22 slash 2. This has a maximal bosonic uh, subgroup, subalgebra, which is uh, SO2, SO4, and uh, U2. I can further rewrite this SO4 as uh, SU2 times SU2, SU21 and SU22. And I can uh, uh, break down this uh, R symmetry U2 in terms of an SU2R and a U1R. 
So it is customary to refer to this guy as the SU2 capital R and this as U1 little r because I am going to um, keep track of these representations by this capital R and I'm going to keep track of this guy, uh, of the charges of this U1 by a lowercase r. Likewise, SU21 and SU22 are associated with J1 and J2. Um, a note of caution over here that the um, when I start talking about specific quantum numbers for states later on and in the exercises, what I mean by this J1 is, uh, which are uh, all SU2 factors, is the J3 part of this SU2 uh, algebra. Okay, so it's going to be sort of the eigenvalues of the J3 generator of this uh, of this uh, SU2, which is going to be specific. Okay. So these are the guys that are going to label for us the um, irreducible representations of uh, 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 Lorentz, um, this SO2, this conformal uh, um, uh, generator, and uh, my R symmetry. Uh, my R symmetry. There are also four momenta, since we're in four dimensions. There's four special conformal transformations, uh, and uh, there's also four Qs, four Q tildes to make a set of eight Poincaré supercharges, four S's and four S tildes for another eight superconformal supercharges. The uh, S and Q anti-commutator, to be very explicit, is given uh, in terms of this expression in yellow. Uh, the alphas and alpha dots are SU2 indices that uh, I use plus and minus to give you the uh, specific SU2 component. And then the capital I is an SU2R index this symmetry and it goes from 1 to 2 because we're in n equals 2. So let's say that I want to construct an index following the recipe that I gave you uh, in the previous pages and in fact I should say and it was an omission that I didn't do so that uh, this uh, uh, definition of this conformal index was given in 2005 by Rommelsberger um, who looked uh, uh, initially at n equals 1 theories and by Kini, Maldacena, Minuala and Raju uh, in the same uh, month uh, who spoke about indices for um, to be more uh, specific n equals 2 and n equals 4 four dimensional theories but you can extend this uh, general discussion to indices in any uh, any dimension in fact uh, uh, Minwala with Raju Bhattacharya and Bhattacharya uh, I think a couple of years later extended it also to any supernormal theories in 3, 5 and 6 dimensions okay so Let's pick, we said that to construct the index, we need one, um, one um, uh, to pick out one supercharge. Let's pick this to be this Q1 minus dot. Okay, so it's going to be one of those guys. And I also want its Hermitian conjugate, which is S tilde 1 minus dot, because here we're working in Euclidean signature and Q dagger is S. These guys, I want to find now the commutant because I want to refine my index commute with the following maximal set of generators um, and I have over here uh, something that this combination okay, of uh, uh, d uh, 2j1 minus 2r minus little r which I call delta 1 plus uh, and then and the reason I call it delta 1 plus uh, actually it's going to become obvious in a minute that this combination comes with uh, uh, from the anti-commuter of q1 plus with S1 plus, and likewise this delta 2 plus comes from the uncommutator of this guy, and likewise. So I can use this. This is the kind of maximal set of linear combinations of generators that commute with Q twiddle 1 minus dot and S twiddle 1 minus dot. And I can use that to define my refined index as follows. Okay, so I have I rho sigma tau. It's going to be a function in this particular case. The commutant has rank 3. So I can introduce three fugacities to refine my index, trace minus one to the f. Here, the fermion number f can be uh, uh, related with uh, the uh, uh, J1 quantum number. It turns out that all the fermions have fermion number, which is odd, and all the uh, bosons in my theory have fermion number, which is even under this construction. So here I've defined my index with respect to Q1 twiddle with these uh, uh, choices for the R symmetry and SU2 uh, two indices, and then I have rho, sigma, and tau, which have uh, are weighted by this delta one minus delta one plus and delta two twiddle uh, 
plus dot. So you see why things become a little bit messy when you go very specifically uh, to a specific uh, dimension and amount of supersymmetry. These were the ones that commuted with both of these guys. So even though this looks a little bit symmetric, one may, needs to be uh, make it completely clear that this guy, this guy, and this guy commute with Q twiddle, but it doesn't mean that um, they commute amongst themselves, okay? So that this commutes with, right? So the thing that you want is for each of them individually to commute with the Q that you've used to define the index. Okay, a couple of notes. Um, we could have defined I with any other supercharge. Okay, so instead of Q choosing Q twiddle one minus dot, I could have used, I don't know, plus dot or Q one plus, or I don't know what. It turns out that even though the commuting subalgebra that you would have used to grade or to refine your index here would be different, the final result when you evaluate the index over the uh, uh, space of uh, local operators of a, a particular theory is the same. The answer does not change. Uh, so the index is a robust observable of your theory. And the indices for different spectromal algebras, but for the same theory, are different. What I mean by this is that, for example, if I have a theory with more supersymmetry, let's say like n equals 4 super Young Mills, I can think of this theory as an n equals 2 theory with one vector mm -hmm. and one adjoint hyper. And I can calculate the n equals 2 index, as I've defined it over here, um, for this n equals 4 uh, theory. But I could also have defined an n a genuine n equals 4 index. So the difference would be that because I have a higher amount of our symmetry and supersymmetry in that case, I have, for example, the rank of my commutant is higher, is 4 instead of 3. Okay, So the indices for n equals 4, an n equals 4 index for n equals 4 super Young Mills looks different than an n equals 2 index for n equals 4 super Young Mills. That's the only thing I want to, uh, to mention. Of course, they can be related by particular uh, limits. Let's say if you reduce the number of fugacities from 4 to 3, there is a limit that relates the two. Okay, so this is all great. Um, so I've given you uh, um, a definition for the index, but how do we go about calculating uh, the index? Well, you should say, ah, it's simple. Uh, if I know what my uh, whole space of local operators is, I can write the answer down, obviously, but uh, uh, usually this is not um, something that we know, right? You know, we don't know the full spectrum uh, of, uh, of, of local uh, operators of a spectrum of theory because that would be kind of halfway through uh, us solving for the theory. But for theories with a marginal deformation, there is a great simplification that we can do, similar to what we said uh, uh, can happen in the case of the Witten index. In fact, because we know that, so if the theory has a marginal deformation, which acts as a, as a coupling, we know that uh, the index does not change under uh, 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 changes, continuous changes of this, uh, of this coupling. Okay? And marginal deformation, I remind you, is a, is a, is a deformation that uh, uh, doesn't um, uh, doesn't break your uh, superconformal uh, symmetry. So I can evaluate the index in the free limit. Let's say I have a Lagrangian theory and uh, um, I uh, have a weak coupling uh, description. Uh, then I, in fact, I can go to the free limit and uh, we're guaranteed that whatever I calculate there does not change at any other value of the coupling. So this is fantastic. There is a small caveat that uh, you can possibly have a little jump from exactly zero coupling to small uh, uh, but uh, uh, finite non-zero coupling, but uh, that you can uh, you can probe. Um, and it's a fantastic simplification and a great uh, um, way in which the index can give us information, let's say, uh, for strongly coupled theories if they have this weakly coupled description and an associated marginal coupling. So in this Lagrangian example, we can do, uh, uh, we can actually use this property to calculate H comprises the set of all local operators that one can construct from free fields if we go to the free limit. And these free fields are the fields that appear in your Lagrangian. Um, and uh, uh, each field is uh, referred to as a letter. So think of the, all the operators that you can build, which uh, uh, give you uh, this H in the free limit as letters, and then you can combine them in all possible ways, which are consistent with the symmetries of your theory, obviously to uh, well, Lorenz, for example, and uh, you know global symmetries, gauge invariant, gauge symmetry, and so on, and construct uh, so-called words. Now, I can evaluate the index over these letters, okay? It's something that I can do. This is sometimes known as the single letter index, and I schematically denote it as i as a function of t. t here could be 
any kinds of fugacities that you introduce as you refine your uh, um, your index. So uh, I refer this with a lower i. Okay, i of t again is schematic. And now I'm going to give you a recipe for how one can go from these single letter indices uh, to the full uh, index. Um, sometimes this is called single particle index because you can think of these also as like particles and then the uh, full index is referred to as the multi-particle uh, version of the index. Okay, one uh, important information, a piece of uh, information that we need here is that when we look at the um, fields that we have in our Lagrangian, these free fields obey uh, certain equations of motion. Okay, so, you know, free scalars satisfy the Lambert type uh, equation, um, or you can have, you know, the Dirac equation for fermions. And uh, these equations of motion, actually, because you see they are like super conformal descendants, two Ps acting on uh, one of my uh, on my free fields um, have to uh, give you relations between uh, operators. So you have to make sure that you're not overcounting. And uh, uh, these uh, uh, equations of motion contribute to the index, but they contribute with the opposite sign to what the state um, would originally have contributed uh, with. So if you have, let's say, an equation of motion involving bosonic states, you just have to have that contribute to the index with a minus sign for fermionic states. So Dirac type equations contribute with a with a plus sign. So then the index over all words can then be obtained uh, through the following recipe. You take the single letter index or the combination of, uh, uh, so you take all the fields that you've got in your Lagrangian, the free fields, you uh, evaluate the contribution to the, uh, to the index, you make sure that you've also uh, uh, subtracted or introduced with the opposite sign any equations of motion. And then you put it through this uh, um, machine known as the plethistic exponential. So first of all, let me give you what the plethistic exponential does. What it does, uh, it is an exponential and uh, it gives you uh, this particular formula where you need to make sure that you write this infinite sum uh, of your single letter index where each of these fugacities that uh, um, um, parameterize your index is raised to the power n. So if I had here rho sigma tau, it would be rho to the n, sigma to the n, tau to the n. Okay? And then I uh, evaluate this quantity. This gives me the full multiparticle or final version of the index at, um, at zero uh, value for the marginal parameter in the, in, in the free limit. What does this physically, this plethysis exponential do? Where, well, you can convince yourself, it's not that hard, that it basically gives you like the multi-particle version of, uh, so it's like creating a Fox space out of a, um, a single particle, but uh, very importantly, it makes uh, sure that uh, it takes into account the statistics of the particles that are involved. Okay, so, um, uh, yeah, so it, it knows how to uh, keep uh, track of the statistics uh, when you politically exponentiate, let's say, a fermionic contribution or a bosonic contribution. So we're almost there for how to calculate this index for a Lagrangian theory with an exactly marginal deformation. If, uh, of course, we're interested in gauge theories, so in a gauge, uh, in a situation where you've got a gauge theory, you want to consider gauge invariant operators. They are, these are the observables of our theory. And uh, uh, that means that we want uh, to uh, only keep uh, the contributions to the index that are associated with gauge singlets. And uh, the final bit of how to obtain the index in this case is related with how um, we do that. When we're talking about uh, gauge theories, each uh, state in your theory will um, be transforming under some representation of your gauge group. For example, states in a vector multiplet transform in the adjoint representation. States in the hypermultiplet can transform in any representation that you like. So let's say this representation is R sub J, where J kind of denotes what representation you're in. Uh, and uh, this is easily determined, as I said again, uh, for the free fields in the, uh, in the single uh, uh, letter uh, index. So don't think of the limit being completely the free limit because there you kind of don't care what happens think that you've got a small coupling in that case so you want to set things up so that when you turn on interactions you only keep uh, the gauge invariant uh, terms so each uh, uh, contribution to the single letter index 
is um, comes with a uh, with a character of uh, the uh, uh, of the gauge group uh, with uh, in the appropriate uh, uh, representation R sub J. Okay, so use an element of your gauge group in this case, and um, it turns out that the characters obey a mathematical property. So the uh, the character uh, of associated with representation R and representation R prime are orthogonal in this sense. So there is some appropriate measure here for this uh, to be correct. You have to consider the unit normalized harm measure. I'm not going to say right now what this means. Just think of it as some appropriate measure that ensures uh, this uh, orthogonality condition between between characters. And the other property that these guys satisfy is the following, that uh, the character of the tensor representation, let's say, uh, of between R1 and R2, is uh, the product of the characters of the representation R1 and R2. So once you introduce these characters and these U's into your index, your single letter index, and then you want to take the plethistic exponential of that guy, uh, you will end up having some um, composite state that transforms in a tensor product of the representations of the three fields and uh, then uh, um, the associated character is simply the product of the characters of the, these representations that appear in the tensor product. Okay, so therefore uh, you can see, you can think of this orthogonality condition or you can use this orthogonality condition of characters as a, uh, as a projector as we'll see in a minute. So uh, let's say that you've got chi star r um, um, with this product of representations, or as we said earlier on, with the character of the representation, a tensor product of ri and so on. So here, what this gives you is the number of times this representation appears in this tensor product. Okay, that's the only thing that it does. So if we want to keep track only of the gauge singlets of a theory, we can employ the above when uh, chi r is the trivial representation, when r is the trivial representation, the character of the trivial representation is 1, star here is just complex conjugation, so uh, uh, chi star is still going to be 1. And what that does is that it's going to give you the number of times the degeneracy of the gauge singlets uh, in this tensor product, which is exactly what we want. Okay, so we have arrived at the final expression for the index for gauge theories with a with a marginal coupling. You, um, as we said earlier on, for these Lagrangian theories, you consider the uh, lithistic exponential of the single letter index. Each of these uh, states contributes to the index as some uh, monomial of the fugacities that refine your index. Because we've got a gauge theory now, there is a, a, another uh, uh, fugacity which is associated with your gauge group. So each state has an associated character that comes in. And to make sure that we only keep track of singlets, we need to integrate in the end with this unit normalized Haar measure, which tells you how many uh, singlets there are uh, in the sort of resulting operator after you take the plethistic exponential. And this is what the plethistic exponential does for you. Okay, so this is, um, let me see what I want to, to do over here. Yes, I want to give you a specific example. So uh, th this is um, roughly speaking how you go about calculating uh, the index for, uh, uh, for, Lagrangian, uh, for Lagrangian theories. Let's be uh, very explicit for the uh, n equals 2 index of n equals 4 super Young mills. So n equals 4 super Young mills, as we said a minute ago, can't be thought of. As a um, as an n equals two theory with one vector multiplet and one uh, adjoint hypermultiplet, the three fields that appear in your um, uh, in your Lagrangian descriptions are are these two, and uh, there are contributions to the index that you obtain just by evaluating the index uh, over the um, over these multiplets and taking into account. Uh, possible equations of motion. These things are going to be some polynomials of sigma, rho, and tau, and the reason is because I'm using now the definition of the index that we gave earlier on, which was this one over here. Okay, so this is a very concrete thing to do. 
and here I only run this index for the single letter index over the vector multiplet and the hypermultiplet fields. There we go. So this is what I mean by this IV sigma rho tau, IH sigma rho tau. H here refers to the hyper and not this curly H, which is the space of local operators in general. Because all these guys transforming the adjoint representation, there's going to be a character in the adjoint of U. I take the platistic exponential and then I integrate this guy over my unit normalized hard measure and there you have it. And so on for other CFTs, okay, CFTs with uh, marginal operators and Lagrangian descriptions. So this, uh, I don't know if this looks straightforward or it looks, um, or it looks complicated, it's actually quite straightforward uh, to do in practice if you get your hands dirty and uh, some of the exercises will make you, force you to do that the exercises are very simple by the way it's not something uh, they're not something complicated they just force you to understand a little bit the notation uh, but in practice it is uh, quite difficult to uh, to perform these uh, gauge integrals exactly so this is the final step so, so this you can do it's not a problem taking this PE but then you have to do this gauge integral um, this gauge integral um, is uh, is challenging and uh, usually we can only do uh, these things in uh, um, special cases. So either if you are uh, considering very, very low rank, even there it's quite hard. Uh, or uh, you can perform a large N approximation if you're thinking about AD safety type of applications and you want to think uh, what happens at large N. There are simplifications in this uh, associated gauge integral. Or uh, more conventionally, what we do is that we take uh, this, which is still a complicated expression, by the way. I mean, you can write it in closed form, but then it includes uh, infinite products of uh, various uh, ratios of polynomials, as we'll see in the exercises. But uh, you can expand these expressions um, in uh, Taylor, expand them uh, order by order in uh, some of these fugacities, and then see if you can do these integrals sort of one by one uh, up to some. Um, up to some uh, um, order in this uh, fugacity expansion. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so that's the end of the discussion of uh, how to calculate, how to define the index, uh, how to uh, write down a closed form expression for its evaluation for Lagrangian theories with exactly marginal uh, uh, the, the couplings. And um, now, uh, in the last um, half an hour or so I would like to uh, discuss two things uh, limits of this index with additional supersymmetry and uh, some uh, application uh, applications and connections to uh, interesting physical uh, systems so the limits uh, uh, that I'm going to be talking about are the following you can as we said the index is some polynomial in these uh, in the fugacities that graded uh, or refine it, and uh, you can consider limits of these fugacities. Um, you will see, as I'll say at the very end, that sometimes it is easier for us to know a uh, limit of the index, which gives you more coarse information about your states or unrefine the index in some sense, but sometimes they're easier to calculate. Okay, so let's see how, uh, and, and you'll see them everywhere in the literature, the kind of uh, limits that I'm talking about over here. So this is again, uh, I rewrite the n equals 2 uh, index, which we gave for concreteness in four dimensions. Minus 1 to the f, we define the index with respect to this q bar 1 minus dot, uh, but we don't have to. This is, uh, these guys are the combinations of generators of this small algebra, <coughs> excuse me, that commute with q twiddle and s twiddle. And this is how this thing was defined. Okay, so it turns out uh, as we uh, already said before, that multiples that contribute um, to this index are annihilated by q twiddle 1 minus this thing. And uh, because I have eight Poincaré supercharges for these n equals 2 theories, uh, we say that the multiples that contribute are 1 8 BPS. Now, we can consider the following limit where we set sigma to 0 and we keep rho and tau fixed. Okay. So um, when is this a good thing to do? You see that because all these guys, all these exponents or combinations um, that we defined were associated with the anti-commutators, let's say, of the charge Q1 minus and its permission conjugate and so on, all these exponents are actually positive semi-definite. 
So I, if I send sigma to zero, it's a well-defined thing to do. I'm not going to get any divergences. Um, uh, and the only contributions which are going to be non-zero are the ones where this delta one plus uh, or the states uh, have a, a delta one plus eigenvalue zero themselves. So it's well defined, and the states that are going to contribute have to satisfy the delta one plus evaluated on them is also zero. So they obey both these states obey both delta one twiddle minus dot zero and delta one plus is zero. Okay, so both this thing is zero and this thing is zero. The exponent so that the contribution uh, is uh, to the index is there and is there with weight one uh, okay so obviously um, these uh, uh, contributions are independent of Sigma this is what my index uh, reduces to and uh, the contributing multiples are, are annihilated both by q1 twiddle minus dot and q1 plus and uh, as a result, they are quarter BPS because they're annihilated by two out of the eight Poincaré supercharges. This is usually how uh, we uh, perform these countings. This limit is known as the McDonald limit of the index. Now, why McDonald? So um, many of the um, limits that I'm going to be discussing here, all of them, in fact, were introduced in a paper by uh, Razamat, um, Gade, Rastelli and Jan. And uh, um, they had some inspiration for these indices uh, by some, um, let's say, alternative description of the index and its relation to some topological quantum field theory in, uh, in, in, uh, in two dimensions. And uh, using that correspondence, they could find that uh, the index had a, um, could be expressed in terms of uh, orthogonal polynomials. And these orthogonal polynomials for different for these different limits were McDonald polynomials, and as we'll see in a minute, whole little wood polynomials, sure polynomials. These are uh, some classes of orthogonal polynomials. As far as we're concerned, it's just a name. Okay, I'm just giving you some vague rationale behind why these names appear in the more modern literature. We just use these names, uh, and and this is like the kinds of things that we mean. I should also emphasize that uh, you can always perform redefinitions of the fugacity. So you might see the indices defined, uh, let's say, with different fugacities, no sigma rho tau, uh, there's other ones, PQT, I don't know what. There is always uh, uh, some uh, um, these redefinitions. You can find uh, what they are. Uh, it doesn't matter which of these fugacities you use. The result is always the same once you revert back uh, to the one that you want. Okay, wonderful. So the second limit that uh, uh, I would like to discuss is the so-called whole little wood limit, and by that I mean the following: it's a subcase of the um, of the McDonald limit. Sigma goes to zero, uh, tau remains fixed, but rho also goes to zero. In that case, the index, the whole little wood index, is defined as such. You can see that if you take these limits, once again. And this is something that we can do because in our definition of the index, uh, as we said, these things come from a commutator of Q1 minus an information conjugate. These things are positive semi-definite. So by taking rho to zero, I do not get anything blowing up. The resulting expression is going to be independent of rho, sigma, and beta. This is my whole little wood limit. It depends only on tau. Wonderful. And the uh, multiples contributing are now annihilated by both the guy whom I use to define my index by uh, and by uh, Q1 plus, which we had for the McDonald, uh, McDonald limit and Q1 minus associated with this row goes to zero limit. Now, interestingly, um, we could have uh, had this discussion already earlier on, but note that the kinds of multiplets that uh, or let's say the primaries, uh, the superformal primaries, um, that uh, the highest weight, yeah, superformal primaries labeled by highest weight uh, states of the maximal compact subalgebra uh, are associated with these kinds of uh, these kinds of representations. Um, let's say j1 is zero, j2 is r. With this little r is the r symmetry u1r quantum number and uh, delta is related to capital R and little r. So you see this starts becoming quite restrictive, the kind of 
the more uh, the shorter the multiplet, the more restrictive um, uh, the kinds of things uh, that you can have. Um, a comment about uh, why this whole little limit is uh, is nice and useful is the following: for Lagrangian uh, linear quiver theories, so you can have can build quiver gauge theories by uh, putting uh, lots of um, um, combining uh, fields with, let's say, different uh, types of, uh, of gauge groups and matter that uh, transforms in uh, representations uh, by fundamental representations, for example, be between these, uh, these these gauge groups. The whole Littlewood index, so this uh, uh, chap over here, coincides with the so-called Higgs, Higgs branch Hilbert series. So the Hilbert series is a different kind of um, counting tool that we have for theories that equals to supersymmetry. It counts some objects on the Higgs branch on the Higgs branch of the theory. Uh, you don't have to know what that is, but for those of you who do know, um, this uh, quantity and this quantity actually coincide. So you can check whether you know you can use this to check dualities. You can use this to check sort of uh, calculations and uh, and so on. It is not true when you quiver theories are not linear. That is, when you're, the shape of your quiver, for example, is a necklace quiver or a circular quiver. The third limit of the index, which is perhaps the most famous limit of the index, is the so-called Schur limit of the index. This limit um, keeps sigma fixed and takes rho goes to tau, rho and tau being the same. If you implement this in the original definition of the n equals to index, you get an expression of this type. And now, even though sigma, as you see here, is in principle fixed, it turns out that the combinations of charges that you have commute not only with the guy we used to define the index with respect to, q1 twiddle minus dot, but also with an additional supercharge. Okay, So it so happens that there's an additional supercharge which commutes with all these guys, q1 plus. So it's almost like you've introduced, you've defined your index with respect to both q1 minus dot and q1 plus. As a result, um, this is roughly speaking also defining uh, the states that contribute to the index are the ones that for which uh, uh, this exponent is zero in addition to this exponent being zero. This is again quite restrictive. Um, and the uh, uh, states that uh, contribute to the index uh, are uh, the are independent, or I should say, the index in the end is independent of sigma. Is what I wanted to say. So uh, what have I done here? Oh, I've I've, I've rewritten the index. I've massaged it uh, a little bit, and uh, this is uh, usually how it is presented. Um, or even more simply, you should say that oh, I'm only tracing over the space of local or the set of local operators for which this is zero and this is zero, and you only see these guys. So sometimes people say it's the trace over the set of sure operators and the set of sure operators are the ones for which these two uh, uh, combinations uh, are uh, in fact zero. Okay, the final uh, limit of the index is the so-called Coulomb branch limit of the index. Um, and uh, you can obtain this by uh, taking tau to zero and keeping rho and sigma fixed. Again, this is a limit with additional supersymmetry. Uh, again, sending tau to zero is well defined because the uh, exponent is comes from a um, from an uh, anti-commutator of q twiddle to plus dot and its Hermitian conjugate is positive semi-definite. And uh, uh, it turns out that the multiples contributing are the ones that are annihilated both by q twiddle one minus dot and q twiddle two plus dot. Notice that in the previous examples, the kinds of supercharges that uh, were annihilating our states were one chiral and one antichiral. In this case, they're both uh, antichiral, um, for example. And it turns out this is uh, called uh, sometimes the Coulomb branch limit of the index because hypermultiplets do not contribute in this limit. So I guess one of the uh, lessons, um, or one of the things that you can do is you can take the various short multiplets or irreducible, short irreducible unitary representations of the superconformal algebra for n equals two, which is the specific case we're looking at uh, over here. 
and uh, say, um, okay, they are characterized by these numbers. Can I evaluate the index for a generic such multiplet, long or short? You find an answer. And then you try and see in these particular limits that we've discussed uh, whether some of these multiplets contribute and some of them do not contribute. And there is a class of multiplets, for example, in this case, which contains the hypermultiplet as a specific example. And uh, uh, the Coulomb branch limit of the index does not count these guys, but it does count the multiplets associated with, let's say, Coulomb branch. Um, operators which parameterize uh, uh, the Coulomb branch of an n equals to theory. Okay, so uh, uh, this was a discussion um, that maybe um, seems a little bit um, maybe too, too, too special for the case of 4dn equals 2, but uh, there are 4dn equals 2 uh, contains a very large class of, of theories and these theories um, you, you see all the time people calculating various limits of the uh, of the index, uh, and you see these names. You see, like we calculate the McDonald index, we calculate the Schur index, or the Hollywood, and so on. So this is just for you to have these words in your vocabulary and to know what this means. It just means specific limits of the fugacities, which uh, uh, count, let's say, some more uh, special classes of short superconformal multiplets. This uh, these kinds of special limits are not. Um, they are not particular to the um, to the case of 4 dn equals two. You can also have limits in other uh, in other cases. For example, in other dimensions, you can you can define similar kinds of of limits. And uh, uh, as maybe I already mentioned, uh, they are useful because there are instances where only these limits can be calculated for various reasons. Maybe we have some knowledge of the spectrum of contributing operators, uh, so you know something about let's say the spectrum of sure operators. So that gives you something. Uh, some information about the Schur index, uh, or you know something, let's say, about the spectrum of Coulomb branch operators, and that gives you information about the Coulomb branch index, and so on. Or it can be that for technical reasons, the calculations are more tractable in these uh, in, in these limits. Okay, so these are kind of some reasons why we might be interested, not in the most general thing, which again is the most refined and most useful thing to write down, but in these uh, specific uh, limits. Okay, so I will finish with um, some applications and connections, why is this type of object useful and what kind of thing can we uh, um, uh, probe with? What kind of thing we can probe with it, I should say. Uh, so one of the most important bits of the uh, parts of the index is that it is invariant under continuous deformations, such as uh, uh, deformations parameterized by marginal couplings. And uh, uh, in this case, you can check, for example, for strong, weak dualities that involve these couplings. A, B, C, F, T is an obvious example. And in fact, in the original paper by Kini, Maldesena, Minual, and Raju, this is the kind of test that they wanted to perform. They wanted to say, ah, I have an equals four Young Mills, and I want to calculate, um, let's say, the index for that theory. There is also a, uh, a gravitational dual theory, which has the same symmetry, by the way. So the same symmetry, uh, so let's say PSU 2, 2 slash 4 is uh, an isometry uh, of uh, uh, or symmetry, I should say, of the gravitational uh, dual theory, type to be string theory on ADS5 times S5. So all the states in that theory should fall into representations of the symmetry group. And in fact, I can evaluate the index in that uh, case as well, and I can compare. And they do such a comparison, and they get some uh, results which are sort of nice and consistent in one sense, and a little bit puzzling in another sense. And we might discuss these in the uh, in the exercises a little bit. Similarly, you can uh, use the index for theories related by RG flows as long as the symmetries that are involved in the definition of the index survives. Okay, so you, it could be that you've got uh, two theories that are related by an RG flow. The UV and IR fixed points are superconformal theories. For these superconformal points, you've got superconformal symmetry. You can define an index. Uh, it's just that if you want to compare these two indices, you have to make sure that the symmetries that are used to define them with respect to are shared by these two fixed points. And you can use this to check, for example, IR dualities. Uh, Dolan and Osborne in 2008 they checked some cyber type dualities using these ideas. Or you can check strong weak dualities, let's say in D equals 3, where you do not have marginal uh, um, deformations. The strong and weak coupling uh, uh, version of the theory uh, follows such an RG flow. And Kapustin, Glad, and Yakov did this uh, successfully in D equals 3 in 2010. In this case, when you don't have a marginal parameter, how do you calculate the index? because you cannot use this fact that you're in the free limit and then you kind of 
continuously uh, deform. Where, uh, well, there uh, comes uh, another technique which I'll discuss uh, just now, and another relationship between the index and, uh, and, and a, a particular quantity. So some of these calculations, in particular the one that I mentioned about d equals 3, are done using the following connection. We've always be, been talking about a superconformal theory in flat space. Uh, uh, so in Rd and uh, with Euclidean signature and in radial quantization. And you know, hopefully well, that uh, these kinds of theories uh, map all the uh, local operators uh, in these kinds of theories uh, via the operator state map are mapped one to one to states in a theory on S D minus one times S one. You probably have seen this in your uh, in string theory courses or in two dimensions where uh, the world sheet, for example, uh, uh, so R R2 gets mapped to uh, S1 times S1, but you can do it more generally in D dimensions, just that uh, you've got uh, this circle, which is a compactified version of Euclidianized time with radius beta, but here uh, you also have a higher dimensional sphere. Notice that the conformal symmetry that we have in this case uh, is a symmetry which is not uh, immediately which is not the conformal symmetry, it's a geometric symmetry associated with the, so we had here SOD and SO2, which was the maximal compact subalgebra of the conformal algebra uh, in, uh, in D dimensions. Here, uh, the SOD becomes the isometry group of SD minus 1, and SO2 is just U1 rotations along this compactified Euclidianized time direction. Okay, so... There is a map between the kinds of uh, these uh, uh, partition functions that you can define in this uh, uh, in this uh, uh, formulation of the theory and uh, path integrals in the um, for the states in the theory on S D minus one times S one. The partition function is just a path integral of the theory in this background, where x here denotes, let's say, a bunch of bosonic fields. If you want to introduce fermionic fields and you want to write down a version of the um, of the Witten index or the simplest kind of version of the superconformal index without any gradings, without any refinements with minus 1 to the f, you also have to integrate, obviously, over the fermi fermionic fields. But you need to provide for me a set of boundary conditions for the fermions. Conventionally, the fermions are antiperiodic, uh, um, have antiperiodic boundary conditions over here. In order not to, if we want the theory to be supersymmetric, we have to consider periodic boundary conditions for the fermions. And how do we introduce the additional refinements? Well, uh, you can uh, actually do that either by changing the boundary conditions of all your fields to reflect uh, these uh, uh, twistings here, where these mu i's are uh, chemical potential, these m i's are the um, generators that uh, go hand in hand with these chemical potentials in whichever way you use to define the index. Or you can keep periodic boundary conditions for the fermions and you can just shift what you mean by delta. So notice that delta here is not really, uh, SO2 is just a geometric symmetry, is in fact encoding, so, so the associated, uh, um, there is a translation along that direction and the associated charge is the energy. Um, so we could call this delta here E, sometimes people call it E. So you shift the definition of your energy to absorb these uh, um, uh, kinds of uh, uh, modifications. Um, and uh, you have, uh, the bottom line is that you have a prescription for mapping your index uh, as a trace of a local operators with uh, minus one to the F and so on, to a very specific partition function for a uh, uh, theory which in principle is supersymmetric on SD minus 1 times S1. And you have a very well defined path integral, a supersymmetric path integral. And for Lagrangian theories, these PIs can be evaluated exactly using the technique of supersymmetric localization. So, supersymmetric localization is uh, um, a toolbox again, so if you want, it's a black box that uh, lets you. Um, take advantage of the supersymmetry, the structure, the supersymmetric structure of your theory to um, evaluate, uh, uh, you deform the theory in a particular way and you kind of, uh, after the dust settles, uh, you find a, uh, basically a deformation which makes the calculation of your path integral much, much easier, one loop exact, uh, 
and is valid uh, uh, to it gives the all orders uh, answer basically. So the operator state map maps these guys, these uh, uh, states, and, and and these indices to a particular evaluation of uh, a path integral of the same theory, by the way, but on a different background, on SD minus one times S one with radius beta. And that path integral, sometimes you can do exactly using localization. A note of caution. So, so this is how some of these uh, some of these statements were actually uh, were actually checked. Now, um, there are uh, many supersymmetric theories that you can uh, write down path integrals for in four dimensions. Let's say on S three times S one beta. And uh, these theories are actually uh, not uh, uh, necessarily conformal. So you could say I have an n equals 2 theory with uh, nf equals 2 nc, which I know is conformal. I put it on this thing, and, and there is a formulation of this path integral in terms of uh, you know, the contributions of the values of the index for the theory in flat space with local operators and so on. But I could just mess around a little bit with a number of flavors such that the theory that I put on S3 times S1 is not corresponding to conformal theory. I can clearly define such a path integral, and sometimes I can even evaluate it. And there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, the thing to keep in mind is that if it is not the theory that corresponds to a conformal one, the corresponding quantity that you calculate is not should not be called an index, strictly speaking. Okay, so it's just a supersymmetric partition function, and uh, uh, only for special uh, theories in these backgrounds we can call the resulting uh, um, um, answer an, uh, an index. So this is just let's say, a subtlety uh, for those who, uh, who, are, who who know a little bit about these kinds of theories and these kinds of calculations. OK, so um, the final thing that I would like to say is that uh, there is another interesting connection um, with a sp specific uh, limit of the uh, spoken formal index, the sure limit, uh, <clears throat> in four-dimensional theories then equals to supersymmetry. Uh, superconformal uh, symmetry. Okay, so for 4D equals to SCFTs, um, there is a nice correspondence or isomorphism, very loosely speaking, between the so-called sure sector of these theories. And you remember the sure sector is the collection of short multiplets that contributes to the sure limit of the index, the particular multiplets that uh, uh, fit that brief, and a so-called two-dimensional Carroll algebra. Okay, so this is. Um, vertex operator algebra uh, in two dimensions. Uh, the correspondence is quite particular, and uh, uh, it was uh, uh, spelled out by this uh, collection of people for these cases, but uh, it has been extended also, let's say, to 6D. Uh, there is, again, a Carroll algebra uh, that uh, um, captures the sure sector of this of six-dimensional theories with, uh, uh, let's say, 2-0 supersymmetry, a uh, superconformal symmetry. The important thing in this correspondence is that it also uh, works for non-Lagrangian theories where we do not have ways of evaluating the index directly. And uh, uh, the proposal is that the Schur index in four dimensions for these types of theories uh, is uh, captured by the vacuum character of these two-dimensional Carroll algebras. And sometimes you can actually evaluate this vacuum character and then you learn something about the Schur index in these four-dimensional uh, four theories. So this is another example where uh, we can find something out about a particular limit of the index, uh, the sure index in this case, uh, from some quantity that we know how to calculate in a different setup. And you can use this to evaluate many indices for non-Lagrangian theories, such as uh, Argyris Douglas uh, theories and uh, uh, theories with uh, n equals 3 supersymmetry, which are non-Lagrangian, and so on. Uh, and there's other ways of evaluating the index using, let's say, connections to topological quantum field theories um, for generic theories of class S. These are theories that you obtain by uh, taking the uh, 2 0 theory and putting it on a uh, Riemann surface uh, with some uh, decorations, some punctures, and so on. So, um, by this, I want to say that there is many different ways and many creative ways in which you can. Uh, evaluate the uh, indices, the superconformal indices. Um, after you, you know, the index is not as good as a partition function because it measures, it counts states 
uh, up to this rule of uh, things that do not recombine under continuous deformations. So you could have missed, for example, you don't even know uh, the, all the contributions um, of, uh, of short multiplets if someone just gives you the index, but it's the next best thing that we can do if someone uh, um, just gives us a theory and, uh, and its symmetries. So uh, I hope this was okay. Uh, I try to be a little bit general. Uh, there's going to be some associated exercise. I hope you learned something. Um, for those of you who have never encountered this, that it wasn't too, too uh, detail uh, oriented. Uh, thank you very much and see you all next week.